So we're going to go ahead. I, didn't, I really didn't know how to exactly preach this message. What I mean is, is the format. I feel like what the Lord wants me to do is to kind of read through, and then when we get to certain spots, kind of bring out some points, but then we're going to, in the end, tell a story. And, uh, and I believe that's how the Lord wants to do this. Danielle keeps wanting to know what the title is, or she did. And I, what I called this morning's message is The King's Valley. And then I told her to put a dash, dash. She didn't understand it. Maybe you won't either until we get into the message. But the King's Valley, dash, dash, whom will you choose to serve? There's a decision that has to be made in every life. Listen to me. Every soul that has ever existed has had to enter the King's Valley. Every soul that will come forward will have to walk through the King's Valley. And a choice is going to have to be made which king is going to be served. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, O Lord God, that you would allow your word to go forth the way that I believe you desire for it to do. Lord God, you said in the book of Isaiah that your word would not return unto you void, but that it would accomplish that which you set it forth to do. Lord, with humble hearts, Lord God, and open ears, Lord God, we ask you, Lord, to speak your truth to us. Holy Spirit, I ask, Lord, that you would be the preacher and the teacher and that your anointing, Lord God, would cause your word to change our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and lot with him into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. And he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai. Real quick, I'm not going to preach it again. I mentioned it last time, I believe. Listen, Bethel means house of God. Ai is, if you got, you got to go back and read, it was a place that God allowed Israel a great victory. And Ai describes, it, the literal name means a heap of ruins. Abraham's tent was pitched between the house of God and a heap of ruins. No, 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 let me say that again. Abraham's tent was pitched between the house of God and a heap of ruins. And each and every day, you and I, as we journey this life, we are in between the house of God, a choice to move towards God, or a choice to move towards a heap of ruins. You might be watching on video this morning. You might be sitting in this place right now, and you might think, my life is a heap of ruins. Hallelujah. Get up and turn towards the house of God and move into the presence of God and let God heal you. You don't have to live in a heap of ruins, my friend. You don't have to live in a life that's infested with demonic spirit that torment your mind, that torment your emotions, that torment your physical body. You don't have to live there. You can get up and you can move by the grace of God towards the will of God and God will heal you. I promise you, he will heal your land. To the place where he had made an altar at the first and there Abram called upon the name of the Lord and Lot who went with him who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together. For their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. Now, I'm not preaching a prosperity message this morning, but I just want to point out to you, God is not opposed to blessing his people, (laughs) physically, spiritually, and financially. I'm just going to say that. And look at this, though. Look, there was strife. Well, let me see what happens when I highlight that word. Can you see that? Oh, uh, see, it's kind of blue. Let me just turn it yellow. There was strife. It was a quarrel. A quarrel took place between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. And that's where I went off and I preached two weeks ago on the mind of Cain and the society that we live in and all of that kind of stuff. Because we live in the midst of a world that's fallen. Y'all remember that message? Y'all can go back and check that out if you like, the mind of Cain. I think it'll help you. Then Abram said to Lot, let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Let me, let me show you what the King James Version says right here, because I'm reading out of the ESV. Because we be brethren. I'm starting to really miss the King James <laughs> sometimes. For we be brethren. We are kinsmen. You and I are brethren. You and I are kinsmen. Do you understand that? We're the family of God. If you're born again, 
If you have invited Jesus Christ into your heart and you have asked forgiveness of your sin, that means the Holy Spirit has moved into your heart. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. And that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in me. And now the blood of Jesus is what connects us. And the blood of Jesus is more valuable, more pure than your mama. You, I love my mom. I'm so glad she's in the house of God. It's more pure and more holy and more important than your mama, than your daddy. Uh-oh, than your husband. I'm not telling you to leave your husband. I'm not telling you to leave your wife. That would be contrary to the word of God. I'm trying to tell you that this right here, this connection, I'm not trying to turn nothing into no cult. I'm trying to tell you the truth of God's word. We be brethren. We have a connection together that is more powerful than anything this world has ever seen. And it's time we start letting the Lord reveal that to our hearts, that we would have compassion and love and caring and mercy towards one another. Because like I told you earlier, if we be the group in this town that understand the writings of the great apostle Paul, it'd be time, it'd be time, King James Version, that the fruit of the Spirit be produced in our life. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, temperance, meekness, and kindness. Not irritability and chaos and tell you about yourself just because you need to be told about yourself and I'm the prophet of God and you know. Yeah, sometimes there's a place for everything under the sun, but you get the point. We be brethren. Do we be brethren? I hope we are. For we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself. I want you to take notice of that because look, I'm about to, we're, about to, we're about to flow in a story here in a second. The whole land, separate yourself from me. And now look what he does. He's given him the option. Abraham, if you take the left hand, I'll go to the right. If you take the right hand, I will go to the left. Now, this is what Lot does. It says, Lot lifted up his eyes, and he saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. In the direction of Zoar, this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, before we get into that, I just want to, I just want to ask you to see something. Look, he lifted up his eyes and he saw the Jordan Valley was well watered. He lifted up his eyes and he said, I just got to have that BMW. He lifted up his eyes and he said... I just got to have that new house that's for sale right there. He lifted up his eyes and he said, I got a better job offer five states away with all the benefits package. He lifted up his eyes and with his logical, sensual eyes and his ears and all of the senses that God gave him so that he could filter out this physical existence, he made a decision. He didn't lift up his heart. He didn't lift up his hand in oath to God. He lifted up his eyes. And the water water was there. The grass was green. He was a shepherd. Animals need food. They eat grass. It makes sense. It's a $10,000 raise, man. Yeah, let me tell you the story again for you that have heard it take a nap. But listen, how long ago it was, I do not know, before I, when I first started working at Bayou Pediatric Associates, before my sister took her life, I went to Dotrieve Hospital. It's a long story, a lot of little weird, intricate details because the place that I'm working now in New Iberia actually bought that old hospital. But anyway, it's another story. I'm working over there what, as a nurse. Working at night, but I'm a nurse practitioner. They find out I'm a nurse practitioner and they offer me a job. The job entails I'm gonna work in a clinic and I'm gonna make $10,000 more a year. So I start, whatever Christian does, whenever we're new in the faith and we don't really know how to get a hold of, let me get a piece of paper. 
And, and I'm not telling you you can't do this. I'm just trying to make a point. Let me get a piece of paper. Let me write the pros and the cons. And let me go get some wisdom from some other men of God that have been serving the Lord longer than me. There ain't nothing wrong with that, but you need to understand something. That's just an opinion of a man. I want to try to talk to you about knowing how to get a hold of the man, Christ Jesus, the mediator between man and God, Christ Jesus, so that the Holy Spirit can speak to your heart and he can reveal things to you that that man on the side of you can't let you come to me, uh, by the grace of God, I don't think I'll do this. But you go to some pastors, $10,000 more, let's see here, calculate that out. That means another $800 a month. That means another $80 a paycheck for the church. Bunch of goobly goop right there, buddy. The logic of man's mind says $10,000 more a year is a no-brainer. Do it. Still got to drive the same amount of time. Still got to still still got to pay for certain things. You so you understand what I'm saying? So, but it looks pretty equal. So I put in my notice. Required a 60 day notice. Y'all just gonna have to hang out with me today. 60 day notice. And what they did was they shoved me off to the other clinic because they probably just okay. Matt's moving on. But we're gonna let him bide his time. He put in he put in his notice. He did the right thing. Okay. From that day moving forward for the next 60 days, all hell was breaking loose. Chaos, irritation, frustration. And I'm so young in the faith, I don't, can't even catch on to what's going on. It's like the Lord saying, hello, like a woodpecker on my head. Hello, I'm trying to get a hold of you. Just kept moving forward, kept moving forward. Till finally one day, I get a phone call from the dude over there. Another problem. Oh, Matt, we're so sorry, man. We forgot to apply for your Medicare number. And it's going to be, you're going to have to work as an ICU nurse for about a month or so. And I'm like, oh, okay. Because look, by this time, I'm already a little more humble. I don't have a problem working as an ICU nurse, but you're going to pay me in nurse practitioner pay, right? I mean, that's what we agreed to because I'm not the one that made the mistake. I mean, look, sometimes we got to stand up for what's right. I'm not the one that forgot to file the paperwork. You, you did that. So what? So now my family has to, you know, suffer? Well, yeah, I, and, and so, so I was in the flesh. Then I said, okay, well, that's fine. Whatever. I guess I don't have a choice. And I hung up the phone. And then I prayed. Should have been praying a long time ago, my friend. But the frustration got to me and I prayed. I said, Lord, if, you, if this is wrong, because it's certain to really, really feel wrong, you're going to have to do something. I need you to cause Dr. Clark, my main boss, to come over here today. Because he, I ain't seen him in a month. <laughs> because we had two clinics. Have him come over here today and have him bring it up. If you're going to do something. How does it even happen, my friend? He shows up. Hey, Matt, how's it going, man? Hadn't seen you in a while. How's that new job coming along? I'm like, man, it's crazy that you just asked that. And I, he, and I told him, and he said, he kind of chuckled. He said, oh, I'm not laughing at you. He said, I was kind of concerned. But, what? The Lord's speaking to him? <laughs> he's speaking to him, and he's listening. And like, here I, what? <laughs> he said, I was kind of concerned, something like that. But look, Matt, you don't. Don't worry about that, man. If you need to hang out here a little bit longer, we ain't trying to get rid of you, dude. Take your time. I'm like, what? Did you just, and I literally, this is how I'm acting. Y'all know me. I'm telling, what did, did, what did you just say? Did you say I can hang out here for another couple weeks to a month while they get their business in order? I said, sir, if that's what you said, can I just have my job back? He said, well, I was hoping you'd say that, but you're going to have to go humble yourself to all the other doctors that you left that paper on there. I'm on it, boss. <laughs> and I went and I groveled and I humbled myself. That was two years in. Look, I'm just going to tell you something. They told me when I started that I would make a certain amount. I'm, I feel weird talking about money. Okay. No, I'm going to tell y'all. I'm going to tell y'all because you know what? Because it's, because I'm not trying to, br I'm bragging on God. They told me when I got hired, I was making about 55 when I got hired that I would one day be able to make 90 when I took that job. To me, that was like a big deal. I mean, at that time, that was a big deal. $90,000 ain't nothing to sneeze at. All right. So I take the job and in two years, I'm frustrated. 
But then this whole thing takes place. I'm going $10,000 more. They ain't not giving me the raises like they said they was going to do. And, and, and guess, and, and listen, but when it was all said and done, check out what happened. But, but listen, I've been cut in half, but I've rode that way for 20 something years. Okay. And I don't never regret that job. I still work there half time. I don't want to leave. Them people been good to me and they've been perfect. No, they have not. But with all that said, listen, more than doubled over the years. You hear what I'm trying to tell you? More than doubled. I, I'm not going to give you specific numbers. More than doubled, okay? And then, this is the clincher. A year later, the clinic that I was about to leave to go to, shut down. Completely shut down. Not even in existence anymore. What I'm trying to tell you is this is that the voice of truth wants to speak to you and I, wants to give wisdom to you and I. And Lot lifted up his eyes and he saw that the plain of the Jordan was well watered and all the grass was green and it made sense to the logical mind. I think I'm gonna choose this place right here. Nobody ever went to the Lord and prayed and said, should I move to Missouri, Lord? Should I move to Minnesota? It's a great job, it's great benefits package. But what about what the Lord wants to do in your heart and in your life. Are we involving God in our daily decisions? Lot lifted up his eyes. Verse 11, so Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. I want you to keep noticing that separation. Abram settled in the land of Canaan while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. I want to mention something about this right now. You know, we have a certain concept that we think of when we hear the word Sodom. And, and y'all already, already got it in your head. I, I need you to get off of that. Because if you do, you're going to miss your own problem. You're going to start thinking, yeah, but I ain't, never, I ain't never dealt with the sin of Sodom. That's not what's going on here. We need to think about the world. Sodom represents the world. Egypt represents the world. Babylon represents the world. Assyria represents the world. Rome, Persia, Greece represent the world. Sodom represents the world. If we put them all together, we could see all manner of all kinds of wickedness and some of the sins of some of those empires you've been living in. And if you just focus on the sin of Sodom, you'll forget about your lust. You'll forget about your lying tongue. You'll forget about your gossiping tongue. You'll forget about your critical spirit. You'll forget about all your stuff. I'll forget about my stuff. That's not what you're supposed to do. We're supposed to look at this and understand that Lot made a decision and he pitched his tent towards the world because it's going to cause all kind of untold sorrow and pain. Now, the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. Listen, I want to just kind of share. I'm pretty sure I'll be able to remember this particular verse, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 8. I want to just go ahead. Look, this is New Testament right here. You understand? Let's go ahead and go to the King James because I like the way he, they say it in the King James better. I always use literal translations, by the way. But look, and deliver just light. Now, this is later on. This is after, this is when the fire and brimstone comes down. This is when the Lord judges Sodom. And this is when the Lord, right now where we're in our story is before that. They, and deliver just lot, look at this, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. And you know that word conversation in the King James Version talks about a lifestyle. Who is the people you're hanging around with, Christian? Because it's talking about their lifestyle. It's not just talking about their talk. Oh, the talk is part of their lifestyle. The filthy, they were vexed by the filthy conversation of the wicked. Look at this, for that righteous man, Look at this. He was, he was the nephew of Abraham. He was the nephew of the father of the faith. And he was following father Abraham as father Abraham followed the voice of God. The word of God says that Lot was a righteous man because he was a follower of the God of Israel before there ever was a nation called Israel. But look, that righteous man dwelling among them, he made a choice to live with them. In seeing and hearing the things he saw, the things he heard, vexed his righteous soul day from day to day with their unlawful deeds. You do what you want, Christian, because look, I'm not your daddy and I'm not the Holy Spirit. I'm a pastor and I love you. And all I know to do is to read it, to ask God to do it in me, and then to communicate it to you.
I'm here to tell you this morning the same thing I've been trying to explain to my daughter since they were knee high to a grasshopper. If you choose to associate yourself with the sinners instead of the righteous. Now listen, I'm not talking about separating yourself to where you never are able to minister the gospel to them. I'm talking about you hanging out with them. Like, you know, like you think you're gonna sit around a table smoking weed, burning weed and talk about Jesus and God's cool with that? You think you're gonna sit there bellied up to the bar, supping on some suds and talking about Jesus to your old boys and your old girls and God's cool with that? No, 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 no. Come out from amongst them and be ye separate, says the Lord. For what right? What does righteousness have to do with the... With with, with the, the sinfulness. What does light have to do with darkness? God wants us to say, you're still going to run into them. You'll still see them. Hey, dude, what's up? Give them some knuckles. Where you been, man? I say, I'm going to tell you where I've been. You want to know the truth? Jesus changed my life. Jesus changed my life. And look, the more confident you get in the power, hell, amen. Give him a hand, lad. Come on. Give him a hand, Clyde. Did he change you? Yes. It's all about him. He'll change you. And he'll give you opportunities to share the good news of the gospel. But look, Don't let that enemy vex vex your soul. Amen. All right, Genesis chapter 13. We're just reading through. We're trying to get get, get a hold of this story right here. Look, he says he looked and he chose, Lot chose that for him. And look at what it says. And Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent towards Sodom. Now, first of all, I want you to know he dwelled in the land of Canaan. We're talking about Abraham, but that's the land that God promised him. I want y'all to understand that. Abraham made it, it was hearing the voice of truth. It's, it's still called Canaan right now. Its name's going to be changed later to Israel. You understand? Okay. So, so Abraham dwelled in the place that God was telling him to go. Amen. All right. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And the Lord said unto Abram, after the, I want you to see this. After Lot was separated from him, God starts to speak. Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which you see to you will I give it and to your seed forever. And I will make your seed as the dust of the earth so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron and built there an altar unto the Lord. God said, lift up your eyes. Look to the north, the south, the east, the west. I'm giving all of this to you. My promise is to you. Why? So that your seed that comes after you will dwell upon the earth. Do you understand what God is saying to Abraham right there? I got a plan, son. I got a plan, and you're part of the plan. They're going to call you the father of the faith. The apostle Paul's going to call, say that those that are children of Abraham are those that are of the faith. Abraham heard the voice of truth. And he said, I will go where you tell me to go. And before Abraham could even see it, God was preparing a land, a land where he could create a nation through whom he could give the world Jesus, who would die on the cross, who would, who would uh, uh, offer salvation to those that are lost. You understand, Abraham's making decisions based on the will of God, based on the plan of God, based on the kingdom of God, not based on what his fleshly desires want. Help us, Lord. I'm just trying to make a point. Every last one of us, I'm not trying to say that that's what you're doing. I'm not trying to say that that's what I'm doing every day. I'm just saying, help us, Lord, to make decisions that are are more concerned. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added unto you. Do we believe that? If we were mind about his business, do we believe that he will in turn take care of our business? I believe that. I, I believe that, my friend. Transition into chapter 14. It came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elasar, Kedor Lamur, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that these made war with Bera, Bera, however you want to say it, king of Sodom. I want to point out something real quick right here. You know what Bera means? Look, you can't even, you can't make this stuff up. No, we're already in the King James. So look, let me just go ahead and show you. I'm going to go ahead and get my little fancy tool out right here. I'm going to do a little boom. Do a little screenshot of that. I'm about to pick this up for you. 
See if I can do that. Look at this. You see that word right there? <laughs> how you, how you, wait, what? Is, is this even really, ha- we ain't even done yet. Is this even really happening? 4,000 years ago, God writing this in here. Wait, what, what is going on here? Sodom, you want to know what that means? Boom. Look at that. Let me get it. Come on. Oh, come on now. Here we go. We're going to do it. Look at this. Well, it, it, you, burning. You can't see it, but burning right here. How, how does this even happen? That four. So let's just, look, we're, we're going to keep moving, but look. Evil one <coughs> ruling over the kingdom of burning. <laughs> okay, here we go. Let's keep going. And with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemeber, king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. All these were joined together in the vale or the valley of Siddim is what a vale is. It's a valley, which is the salt sea. Twelve years they served Kedorlamur, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. And in the fourteenth year came Kedorlamur and the kings that were with him and smote the Rephiams. Boy, there's a lot we could talk about right there. These are the giants in the land. These are the, the demonic offspring, but we're just going to keep on moving. And Ashtaroth, look, if you know about this stuff, it's a mess, man. These are, this is wickedness. This is God. So they were fighting this stuff back in the gap, okay? And Ashtaroth and Corneum and the Zuzums and Ham and the Emums and Shava, all these things are of these, this, this evilness. And the Horites in their Mount Seir unto El Piron, which is by the world, 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 is by the king of Bela, the same as Zoar, and they joined battle with them in the vale or the valley of Siddim. With Kedolomer, the king of Elam, and with Tidal, king of nations, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Eleazar, four kings with five. Y'all would have already quit reading that at home, right? But you're going to miss it. You're going to miss what's about to happen. Okay. Uh, and the veil of Siddim was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. So now they're getting whooped, and they're taken off. And they fell there. It doesn't mean they died. It means that they were overcome. And they that remained fled to the mountain and they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, talking about those other kings, took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and they went their way. And look at this. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son who dwelt in Sodom and his goods or his possessions and departed. That's a problem. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite brother of Eshcol and and brother of Aner, and these were confederate with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, oh, we ain't even started preaching yet, I'm just reading. When Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them all the way to Dan. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants by night, and smote them and pursued them into Hoba, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. And the king of Sodom, and Sodom, this is what I want you to know. This is the title of my message, the king's valley. In, in the ESV version, it says that they went into the king's valley. Okay. It says the king's dale right here, but again, a dale is a valley. In the ESV version, it says the king's valley. So I want you to see this. The king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kedolomer and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheva, which is the king's valley. So here's the king of Sodom. Here's the king, the evil one, king over the burning kingdom. I want you to see this. Coming to meet Abraham in this valley. And... Y'all remember Melchizedek? If y'all weren't here on Wednesday night, I'm sorry. Y'all can go back and watch a teaching that we did about three or four weeks ago about Melchizedek. We spent some time on Melchizedek. We're about to get, we're going to get, we're going to get, we're not going to leave you hanging. We're going to give you a little bit of that, okay? And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. Well, let me go ahead and just break it down for you real quick while we're here. Melchizedek. We did this on the Wednesday night, but for, listen, y'all, y'all just chill out, man. All of you grown-up Christians, look. We got, just chill out. 
they got some people that weren't here on Wednesday night. So let's break it down. Let's break it down real time. Mel, kids, a deck. Why are you doing all this, preacher? Because every time I read the word of God and I realize God wrote something 4,000 years ago that is screaming to my spirit that it's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and you're still fighting the same battles, you're still fighting the same enemy, and I am still offering my goodness to you. When is my people gonna wake up? When are my people gonna give their heart to me? When are these, this, this creation gonna serve me? And Listen, if we can find it in the word right here, this is amazing to me. Melchizedek, a compound word. Melk, what does it mean? King. King. What does Zedek mean? Say it. Y'all whispering it. Righteousness. King of righteousness. What was he king of? Salem. What is Salem? Ancient Jerusalem. What does Jerusalem mean? Peace. <laughs> Wait, hold on, dude. What? <laughs> really? Yeah. 4,000 years ago. In the King's Valley, two kings show up. Evil one over the kingdom of burning and king of righteousness, king of peace, priest of God most high. Two kings show up in the valley of the kings to meet Abraham, father of the faith, the one who went before us, who heard the voice of truth and followed, making decisions based upon the eternal promise of God. Oh, come on now, church. It don't get no better than this. If I can't convince you with this, then you don't want to be convinced. You do not want to be convinced. Help us, Lord, if we don't want to be convinced because we sure don't want to, to reign, to let, we sure don't want to make a deal with the king of the evil one. We sure don't want to make a deal with the one that's ruling and reigning over the burning. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. Did I just say that? Yes, I did. <laughs> Wait, what? what? Wait, what? Bread and wine? Bread and wine? 4,000 years before Jesus would ever show up on the face of the earth? Bread and wine? What does bread and wine represent? What are we about to do? We're about to take communion? What does this mean? What does this mean? It means God offering communion. He brings communion. And he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the most high God, which has delivered your enemies. Look, Melchizedek's telling him, you know how you won this thing, right? Can I tell you that Abraham knows how he won this thing? You know what's beautiful? Same voice of truth that told Abraham to saddle up and go is the same voice of truth that's speaking to him right now. And he's going to recognize it. And look what it says which has delivered your enemies into your hands. And look what it says. And Abraham gave him tithes of all. Oh, it's about to get good. I'm about to start preaching on tithing. And let me tell you why. Not because I, I want to force you to pay your money. As a matter of fact, pay your tithes wherever you want to pay your tithes. Don't pay your tithes. Honestly, I'm not trying to make you feel weird. I promise you I'm not. I'm try, I want to help you. Yeah. And what I mean is, I, see, I don't have a problem with this. I mean, by the grace of God, I'm not trying to sound sassy or whatever. I'm just me. You know me. I don't have a problem with this. I've been paying. My, I had a problem with it. I don't have a problem with it. I pay my tithes. I pay 10% of everything that I make. Well, I'm not going to do that because it's my. Then don't do it. I'm just trying to talk to you about what the word means. I'm trying to explain to you the word. I want you to still come back next Sunday. Don't get offended. Don't get mad at me. I want you to come back. I'm trying to speak truth to you. I'm trying to tell you what God's word says. I'm about to break it down real time. We might talk about it tonight, but we're definitely going to talk about it in a Wednesday coming up. The tithe shows ownership. The tithe says that you are my God, I am your possession, and I'm about to recognize it up in my life right now that you are my master, and I'm about to show it through a step of faith. And let me tell you something, Christian. 
I dare you. (laughs) I dare you to test God on this. I dare you through an act of obedience to test God in this area. Oh, what you're trying to say, you're trying to be one of them word of faith preachers and no, as a matter of fact, I'm not, you may not even get a a prosperity, uh, a financial blessing. I believe you will at some point in time. I'm trying to talk about spiritual blessing. Oh, I can pay for a spirit. No, it's your heart. It is your heart of faith. Just as you get up and you pray in the morning and you're believing that there's a God in heaven that hears you. You're believing there's a God in heaven that sent his son Jesus to die for you. When you pay your tithe, it is an act of faith and an act of worship that says, yes, God, I know you can take care of my needs. I know you can bless me. You you pay your tithes wherever you want. God's been taking care of this place. Amen. He has. I mean, I told y'all before, I'll tell you again. Some of y'all guessed, but look, you showed up. This, this building is paid for. That, that in five years, that, that lot over there is paid for. And we got $60,000 in the bank. I'm just trying to make a point. The Lord's blessing. Oh, well then I don't need to give you no money. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Whatever you say, boss. I'm just trying to make a point. And if nobody would give, then we'd still be struggling. Oh, what are we going to do about the lights? Anyway, let me keep going. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. Boy, if that don't sound like that rotten devil. I'm going to give you some worldly possessions. I'm going to give you some of this stuff that the rest of this world is searching for. Cares of the world. Deceitfulness of riches. I mean, you got a right, dude. You make $90,000 a year. You got a right to go buy you a better house. You, you, do you realize no matter how much money you make that you can overspend? Do you realize that, that, that there's a spirit behind greed and lust and that no matter how much money you get on your paycheck, you will overspend it, my friend, and you will always be living in a pit and you will have a hole in your pocket. You will have a hole in your pocket. You don't have to. I don't have to. You know, well, I can't afford the 10%. I'm not even preaching on tithing, man. I'm, making, I'm telling you I'm not. I know it seems like I am. I can't afford the 10%. You can't afford not to pay it. What you, what you and what we need to do, and I've said this before, we need to learn how to, what to do with the 90%. Yeah. Right? I mean, now, come on. We need to know what to do with the 90%. We need to quit overspending. We need to quit spending it on on our greedy guts if we are. Lord, help me. I'm not trying to pick on you. I'm talking to myself. We need to understand delayed gratification. Oh, I got to have it now, man. I live in America. Let me go through the drive-thru at Burger King. I want pickles. I want mustard. And I don't want lettuce. And I want it now. And I want it in five minutes. And if you don't get it to me right, I'm going to be mad. I'm going to McDonald's. It's the world we live in. I want it now. No. No, it don't work that way, friend. God wants you and I to learn how to endure. He wants you and I to learn how to persevere. He wants you and I to learn how to move through chastisement and education and instruction and to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And when he sees fit, (laughs) humble yourself. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that in due time he will exalt you. He'll give you the promotion when he thinks you're ready. He'll give you the raise when he thinks you're ready. He'll give you the new car when he thinks you're ready. He'll give you the new house when he thinks you're ready. Okay, y'all get the point. But look, the king of Sodom said, just give me the souls. That's what another translation says. Give me the souls. Give me your soul. And let me give you some stuff. See, that's the spirit of the world, my friend. Whether or not you think you're selling, whether or not the world thinks they're selling their soul to the devil, they, I mean, most of them people ain't like Ozzy Osbourne, rock and roll stars who sold their soul to the devil so they could get power. That stuff's real too, but, but most people ain't there. You don't have to think it's real. You can laugh at me in your head if you want to. I'm telling you it's real. I'm telling you this stuff is straight up real. You don't believe me? Go ahead. Check out Joe Schimmel, Good Fight Ministries. Go ahead and check out the documentary, They Sold Their Souls for Rock and Roll. You watched the 10 hours that I paid 115 bucks for, and I watched about 10 times, and you tell me if you're not convinced whenever you're done watching it. But until you watch it, don't talk no trash to me, my friend. Devil's real. And he's offering a deal. 
He's offering a deal. And you may not sell your soul for fortune and fame, but if he can just keep you out of the hands of Jesus and let you just get along in this world. Oh, but everybody likes me. Everybody likes me right now. I'm just a little bit nervous. If I start slinging that name Jesus around, they're going to start looking at me cross-eyed. They're going to start thinking I'm weird. Good, good. You're a peculiar people. I have learned that the more vocal I get for the Lord, Lord, let me hear your voice. And I don't always act like this in public, like when I'm in the hospital. I kind of whisper a little bit. I'm like, hey, hey, dude, I love you, bro. And I know you love the Lord. But I don't believe that I'm supposed to pray to Mary, too. See, y'all got that wrong. The Bible says there's one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. And I said, look, dude. I've been building a relationship with this guy for a long time, ever since I've been over there in New Iberia. I said, look, buddy, the Bible says we're not promised tomorrow. I'm not trying to say something bad is going to happen to me or you. I might not even have a job when I come back on Monday. I don't know. The Lord might move me somewhere else. But if I don't see you again, as you journey the rest of this life, don't, don't be looking to a church, my friend. Don't be looking to a religion. Look for Jesus. Is it okay if I say that? He said, no, I asked him. Is it okay if I say that? He said, that was pure. And I said, thank you, bro. And I went and took care of my business. But he's also seen my work ethic. He sees me doing my own swabs. He sees that's the job of a nurse. He sees me sticking them in the bag and running them to the lab. That's the job of a tech. He sees me starting IVs so that I can become a better, even though I don't have to anymore, so that I can become better at skills that I've lost from the past of being a little lazy nurse practitioner. Not really ever lazy, but I'm just trying to say. He sees me doing all of these things. But why? Teamwork makes the dream work, baby. And listen, the other day, look, this is a whole other thing. Whenever you're working and you're getting slammed. You need to understand something. God has positioned you in a place for you to be productive. You, whenever somebody gives you a job, you need to get your head right, man. You are a servant of the most high God. You need to quick get, check your attitude at the door. You need to humble your heart and you need to be the hardest worker in the pipe yard until, and because look, the Lord can't promote you. Look, I don't know why I'm even doing this because I need to preach. But look, you know where I started off when I first got my heart, gave my heart to Jesus? I was a high school dropout working in a pipe yard at Spirit Enterprises, getting Varsol all over my foot with blisters all over my leg. And you know what? I'm just trying to say, like, promotion comes from the Lord. And it don't happen overnight. Get your head right, understand that you're a servant of the Lord and that you work as though you're working for the Lord. And he also says in bosses, if you're a believer, don't withhold that which is right. And you need to also understand bosses, y'all need to also understand you have a God in heaven. <laughs> oh, well, I'm the boss. Yes, you are, sir. I'm the boss and you do what I say. Yes, that is correct, sir. But there's a right way and a wrong way to do that. And I, look, y'all are all, all equal opportunity right here. The bosses get it. The, the believers get it. The preacher gets it. We're working for Jesus. Our work ethic is a reflection of the God we serve. Don't sit just, if you're going to sit here and tell them about your Jesus and you're lazy on the job, that's a problem. Is it okay if I say these things? It needs to be. If we are lazy in our work, we got a bad attitude, always calling in. Come on, somebody, help me out. Do you know what it's like whenever you call in? This wasn't even in my message. This is just free stuff right here. When, you know what it's like for other people when you call in to work? We've all called in to work, but I'm hoping that we only call in when we're really, really, really sick. I'm not asking y'all to do what I do. One day I had a stomach virus. I puked 12, three times in between every patient and I did not want to leave. And I didn't even tell anybody I was sick because they were going to have to close the whole clinic down and they would have lost about $1,200. That's how I was thinking. Was that completely right? I'm not even saying it was. I'm not saying that you have to do that. I'm just trying to make a point. We should be looking for ways to stay at work instead of calling in. Because when we call in, all the workload goes on to someone else. That's why I'm over there swabbing people, sticking it in a bag, running over there, because I'm just trying to make the whole thing flow. 
That's all. Because while I'm there for 12 hours, there's work that got to get done. The waiting room got 50 people. Oh, one little guy's going to make a difference. You better believe it. That's going to make a difference with me running around doing all this stuff when, all the other, when some of the nurses are getting a bad attitude. Oh, don't send any more back here. What are you, what? what? I got no choice but to send some people back there. I got 15 people in this place right here and I got 10 more in the waiting room. I can't see all the, physically see all the, oh, I can, but then everything's getting backed up. It doesn't work that way. No, man up, woman up. Did you hear what I said? I said it. Get a backbone. Uh, We were praying this morning. Give us tough skin, but soft hearts. Tough skin, but soft hearts. Man up, woman up, and take a little bit more on your plate. And if we would all do that, teamwork makes the dream work, my friend. But if we all get a bad attitude, oh, the boss don't love me, or this company stinks, or blah, 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 and we go over there by the water cooler, sipping our water, bad attitude. That is not Christianity, my friend. Now, listen, we all fall short, and I've fallen short too. I'm just speaking the truth to you. This is the truth, all right? I believe it is anyway. And if it steps on our toes, Lord, help us. He said, give me the purses, take the goods. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. Aren't y'all glad we got some pe- sweet people like Mary with her message and that y'all ain't got to listen? <laughs> We're going to start letting other people preach, amen, <laughs> so that I'm not so hard. Like, oh, Lord, he preaches so hard. We got sweet people like Mary and Angie's different and praise God. And thank you, Jesus. Keep sending more people. But it's stuff we need to hear. That I will not take, look, this is Abraham. I will not take from a, from a thread even to a shoe, la- shoe latchet and that I will not take anything that is thine. He's telling this to the king of Sodom. Look at this. He said, I will not take anything that is yours lest you should say you have made Abram rich. Oh, no. For those of you that just came in, this is the king of Sodom. I just want to let you know his name is Bera. That means evil one. And he rules over a kingdom, Sodom, meaning burning. We've already broke that down. And he's meeting, Abraham's meeting in the valley of the kings with two different kings. One is Melchizedek, king of righteousness, king of peace, priest of God most high. And the other one is king of the burning ones. And he's evil one. And Abraham says, I'm not going to take anything from you because you're going to try to talk about you made me rich. No, because look at this. Only that which the young men have eaten. I'm going to do the right thing. See, there's right and there's wrong. Right? You can't go around expecting. Okay, let me just stop. And the portion of the men which went with me, Aner, Eschol, and Mamre. All right. So now we're going to preach. Y'all ready? We're going to preach. In in chapter 13, verses 8 through 18, Abraham said, let there be no strife between us. Now, that word means a quarrel was taking place. It means a a dispute. It means a fight. And it's the same definition. It's not the same word because this is Hebrew. But in the lust of the flesh, in the book of Galatians, quarreling, strife, division. You understand? That's the lust of the flesh. Can you not see in times of your life where you've had a quarrel with your brother, with your brother or your sister in the Lord? There's a quarrel that's already, listen, the strife is already existing in the scene. It says strife was taking place between the herdsmen of Lot and the herdsmen of Abram. So the strife was already there. Don't think that they weren't feeling it. Sometimes you walk into a strife and a quarrel and you can feel the tension that's in the air. But Abraham said, let you and I not have strife between us. Why, Abraham? Because we're brothers. There there ought to not be strife between us. We're the house of God. I'm preaching to the preacher. There's been times in my heart whenever people in the church have done certain things and it's irritated me. And there's parts to me that want to say, dude, grow a backbone. Or come on, mama, get over yourself. That's That's what I want to say. And I probably have said stuff like that. And it's true. Get a backbone. Come on, mama, get over yourself. Get tougher skin and a softer heart. All that's true, but guess what? If my heart is getting hard, it's not coming out with love. And it needs to come out with love because they need to know that I love them. They need to know you love them. They need to know that we're brothers and we're sisters. 
There, there needs to not be division in the body of Christ. He says, let there be no strife between us because we're brethren. I thought about this psalm. Well, let me go ahead and turn to it real quick. Y'all just bear with me. I don't get too many times to preach. Psalm 133. I love this psalm. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Oh, man. It is like the precious ointment or the oil upon the head. See, it's hard for us to connect to this because we weren't ever there. The priests were anointed with oil. The kings were anointed with oil. Oil is the type of the Holy Spirit. It's like the ointment or the oil upon the head that ran down upon the beard. It goes from the head to the beard, even Aaron's beard. There's something here. Theologically, there's something big. I stayed up late last night trying to, and I found a lot of it, but there's more to dig out of this. This is the, listen, this ain't just a, this ain't just a high priest. This is the first high priest. All the, I'm talking about Aaron. All the other high priests came from him. In that sense, he's a type of Jesus. Even though Jesus comes from the order of Melchizedek, this is a type of Jesus. Okay. And listen, what is the heart of Jesus? Love, compassion, unity. It went down even on the, skirt, the skirts of his garments. And so we see... In this passage of scripture, Abraham says, let us not have strife between us because we're brothers, we're kinsmen, we're, we're brothers in the Lord, We've, we're saved and we have a relationship with Jesus Christ and there's supposed to be unity, not division because when there's division and disunity in the house of God, the tension is in the house, right? The tension's in the house and when people walk in, they don't feel the love of the Lord, they don't feel the presence of God because we're just all thrown off and we got our own little cliques and we're divided against each other instead of us truly loving one another. And we need a work of the Holy Spirit to do that in our heart. Amen? I mean, because you're not going to muster it up yourself, my friend. He and Abraham had strife and it ended in division. Remember that? Abraham made a decision to separate. I've never seen it like this before. When he separates. Now look, what I want you to know is that Abraham has discernment right here. I believe that. The strife is already there. It's between the herdsmen and he can sense it. He can sense it and he says something bad's about to happen. And he goes to Lot and he says, listen, we don't need strife between us. Why, Abraham? Because we're brothers. We're kinsmen. So look, let's just go ahead and go our separate ways. And, and, and then he does this. He says, you choose for yourself what looks best. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. Yeah, that's the word of God right there. That's the book of Romans right there. That's prefer your brother over yourself. Don't it? I'm, I'm just going to leave it like that. Do we do that? <laughs> Do we prefer our brothers and sisters over ourselves, or do we take what is best for us first and let them have the leftovers? That's another story for another time. He said, and look, and I want you to know this, God speaks to him. Two things happen. I kind of repeated myself in my notes. Two things happen after they separate. The Bible says, number one, God spoke to Abraham. Listen to me, Christian. Sometimes when you're connecting yourself, even though they be believers. I'm not trying to tell you to isolate yourself from a believer, but what I'm trying to tell you is, is that if they knee deep in the stuff of the world and they are not, and every time you're around them, it's causing chaos and irritation and confusion in your spirit, man, you might need to steal away and seek the face of God for them and seek the face of God for yourself. And when you separate yourself, you may be surprised that you start to hear the voice of the Lord again, because as soon as they separate if you go back and read the text, two things happen. God started speaking to Abraham, and this is what he told him. If you'll remember, I read it to you. Look to the north, look to the south, look to the east, look to the west. And my, I don't know that that's west. West. West, I think. West. Thank you, Bradley. Thank you, hunters and fishermen. Don't put me in the woods, please. <laughs> look to the north, the south, the east, the west. All this I'm going to give to you and for your descendants after you, for your seed after you, because I got a plan for you, Abraham. Will you believe the voice of truth? 
God, I'm going to give you a land. And I'm going to make you a people. And I'm going to give the world my only begotten son because I so love the world. I don't want them to perish. I want them to gain eternal life. I'm doing something on this earth, Abraham, and I'm looking for somebody just like you, sir, that will hear the voice of truth and will believe me and move forward. So God speaks to Abraham. That's number one. And then when you want to know what number two is, it doesn't need a lot of explanation. Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom. One was led by the spirit of God based upon an eternal promise. And the other one was walking in the flesh and made a decision based on what he thought was going to be best for him. Now, I want you to listen, this is some deep stuff, my friend. I mean, I believe it is. It's a whole, okay, I'm going to be sweet. This is some deep stuff. That God, this, one of them made a spiritual decision based on an eternal promise. The other one made a decision based on what he thought was best for him. But now in the story, he's captive. He's captive to the enemy. Lot I'm talking about. Lot done got caught up in a skirmish of life. You hear what I'm trying to tell you? You see where I'm trying to go with this? He pitched his tent towards the world. If you go further in the story, the Bible says he's at the gates of the city. What did they do at the gates of the city? In ancient times, they conducted business. He's over there rubbing shoulders. He's popping knuckles. Hey, what's up, world? Let's do some business today. Um, and then next thing you know, he's living straight up in the city. Y'all can go back and read the story for yourself. He vexed his righteous soul. He put himself right back in the world. And, and then people get mad at me whenever, I know that you do. I know you get irritated when I talk about certain things because I know because when people used to do it before I had a revelation, I got irritated. I'm not gonna stop. If you feed yourself, I don't even listen to secular music anymore. I'm just trying to make a point. I kissed a girl and I liked it. It's an agenda. Um, Motley Crue, I use that one all the time. I'm going to take a swig of whiskey and jump into the saddle with you. Does it take a lot of understanding to figure that out, what he's talking about? He's talking about getting drunk and having sex with somebody you probably ain't supposed to have sex with. Because that's the lifestyle. That's the spirit of antichrist. Feed your flesh. Make decisions that are best for you. That's the words of, I'm not even trying to get weird on you, Aleister Crowley. The, the guy that Ozzy wrote the song about, you ever heard his mantra? Do what thy wilt and let that be the whole of the law. Feed your flesh, man. YOLO, baby, you only live once. Go on and get you some. Okay, Lot. Now you find yourself taken captive in the skirmish of life. You're under the control of the enemy and you can't get out. But hallelujah, your uncle ain't forgot about you. And I want to tell you, and I want to tell you, and I want to tell myself, let us not leave our brothers out there. Now, I'm not the kind of guy that's probably going to go get you in a bar room, unless the Lord tells me. And this is, let me tell you why. I will. If the Lord tells me, I will go get you out of a bar room. But let me tell you why I probably won't go do that. Because if you're in the bar room right then and there, that's where you want to be. But I need to pray for you. <laughs> I need to not let my heart get hard towards you. I need to not let, let my heart get hard to the point where I'm over here talking about, I told you, Lot. I told you to make a better decision all that time we were walking together. You didn't listen to me. And now your heart has gotten hard. And now you're not praying for nobody. And if you and I ain't praying for them, who's going to pray for them? They're just not getting prayed for. They're just under that bondage. That does, I, I think that that sounds like us, though, to some extent. You know, another thing I was saying here, Abraham was a peacemaker. He said, let there not be strife between us. We are brethren. He's a peacemaker. You hear that? Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. You, you know, it requires humility to be a peacemaker. Oh, but that dude wronged me. Oh, he ain't even a brother. He ain't even a brother. He don't know the message of the cross. Oh, he don't know the message of the cross. He ain't a real brother. Oh, but he, he, lo he might love Jesus. <laughs> he might want to know. Uh, yeah, he ain't even a real brother. 
I ain't going to make it. Because, see, in order for peace to be made, somebody got to humble themselves. Oh, this is, I'm preaching way better than you, amen. And because you want to know who humbled himself? Your Jesus. Your Jesus humbled himself. He lowered himself so that he could die on the cross. And we over here like, oh, no, they wronged me. I'm going to get my day in court. Lord, help us. So as soon as Abraham hears it without questions, he prepares to go to battle for his brother. His plan is to rescue Lot. My question is, what do we do when our brother's in a bind? I'm talking to myself. I'm trying to stir you up so that we understand when our brother's in a bind. Listen, I've got people in my family that my heart has softened towards in the last week. People that have done me wrong. I'm just going to be real with you. In the real eyes of the world, I got every right to hold them in contempt. Y'all know what I'm talking about because y'all do it too. Don't try to act all holy up in here. <laughs> oh, no, but you don't know what they did to me, okay? Well, do you know what you did to Jesus? <laughs> Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Bitterness will ruin your relationship with God. Bitterness will fester like a poison on the inside of your heart, and it will intertwine itself in the very spiritual DNA on the inside of you, and it will start to choke the life of God out of you. And you won't even know it. <laughs> You'll sit there the whole time like, mm-hmm. I knew that was going to happen to that brother. Look at him now. And there's some truth to that. Whenever, you, whenever somebody takes advantage of you and you are the child of God, let me tell you something. You ain't even got to like, try to get your vengeance because the Lord's going to show them who the boss is. But what my heart needs to be is, Lord, please have mercy. Please have mercy. And not like, Lord, please have mercy, because I know that you told me if I pray for that brother, you're going to heap hot coals of fire on his head. No, that's garbage. Oh, no, that's the word of God. But that's God's decision if he's going to heap hot coals of fire on their head. My heart needs to be, Lord, you've had mercy on me. How are you going to get forgiveness if you ain't forgiving? That's some hard stuff. Huh? Some good stuff, though. It'll set you free. If we start being obedient to the word of the Lord, I'm telling you right now, grace will flow and you will get set free. Amen. Amen. So what do we do when we see a brother in the bind? After the battle, the king of Sodom comes to Abraham and suddenly the story is interrupted with this new character named King Melchizedek. King of righteousness, king of Salem, meaning king of peace. And in order to really appreciate this, we need to understand that this is before there was an Israel. This is before there was a tabernacle, much less a temple, before the Levitical priesthood, before the sacrificial system. And this king, king of righteousness, king over peace, priest of God most high, he serves the God that created heaven and earth. It is impossible to think that this is not a purposeful comparison to show us that this king is a type of Christ at the very least and may actually be a man manifestation of Jesus on the earth at that time and that this story is revealing to us this is the important part of this message that there's an age old spiritual truth on the battlefield of life you will walk through the valley of the kings you Sabrina you Robert you Pat Martin me Matt Abair you Jessica you Danielle we will all walk through the valley of the kings and there we will be met we will be met with the evil one that rules over the burning, and we will be met with king of righteousness, king of peace, priest of God most high. They will meet us there, and there will be a choice to be made. Who will we serve? I'm not talking about a VBS little Bible school day. I raise my hand on back in the day. That ain't serving the Lord. Man, I used to love Lance Rowe. I learned a couple tricks from old Lance Rowe. That's that dude that used to carry the cross to, and went with him to Bourbon Street, all that stuff. I heard he, somebody say, oh, I love the Lord. He'd be on Bourbon Street. He'd be on Bourbon Street holding that cross, telling people how much Jesus loved him. And they walk up, I love Jesus. I was raised in the church. He's like, what you doing with that beer in your hand, man? Dude, come and put your beer down. Get, get your knee. Get on the, let's give your heart back to the Lord. Let's get right and help me minister Jesus. Boy, like, why? it's not that big of a deal. You are living in the midst of the world, dude. You're pitching your tent in Sodom. Oh, you preach too hard. No, I preach truth. It will destroy you if you continue to keep yourself connected to them. 
They are not us. We are not them, but let us love them and let them see something real. And at the same time, I've seen people come back and say, dude, thank you so much. I was raised in church, man. I don't even know how I ended up here. And he'd say, praise God. Let's pray, brother. Let's pray that God does a work in your heart. You see what I'm saying? Like, that's the thing. That's the thing. Who are we going to serve? Which king are we going to choose? Both the enemy, Satan, and Jesus are offering an agreement. One's offering communion. The other one's offering, man, you can live an easy life in this world. You just go ahead and play the game, my friend. You can even go to church. <laughs> I'll even let you go to church. I just want your soul. I, I, I'm gonna give you, I'll let you have the good life. I'll let you have the good job. I'll let you have the good little relationship. You can even have it put, put up a picket fence if you want. And you can go to church. And, and everything's gonna be cool. No, it's not. It's a lie. Because sometimes we wonder why everything's falling apart. First of all, let us get our heart right with the Lord. But secondly, let us understand that Jesus said, if they hate you, they first hated me. Abraham is a type of the spirit-led believer, and he recognizes that there was a potential problem. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. So then another king, the evil one, shows up, and he wants the soul. He wants to give him possession. And Abraham instead says this, I won't take anything from you. I like this. For I have lifted my hand to God. You know what to lift a hand means? It's like taking an oath. Dude, if you do some studying on the oath of the ancient times and biblical times, the oath was some serious stuff. You don't break an oath. You don't, when you take an oath, you don't break an oath. Abraham said, I've lifted my hand to God. I ain't about to lift my hand to you too. You're going to turn around and you're going to say, you blessed Abraham. No, 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 no. I serve the God, of the creator of heaven and earth and all that in it is. That's who I serve. Instead, he turns around and he pays a tithe to the king of righteousness. The tenth. I want to say this, and I'm going to try to build on this because, listen, I stayed up so late last night because I was loving this stuff. And it's going to take me time, though, to unpack it. The tenth shows ownership. God took Levi. You got to go back and you got to go to Exodus chapter 13 and you got to read through this and it's all connected to the Passover and it's all connected to the judgment that God put on the rest of the world and the fact that the firstborn, he killed the firstborn. You understand that? This is all connected to the firstborn. Who's the fulfillment of the firstborn? His name is Jesus. God killed the firstborn and whenever he turns around, he says, listen, every beast that opens the matrix, what is that? Talking about a woman's cervix. In other words, the firstborn. Every firstborn of your animals, you're gonna, you're, if it's a clean animal, you're going to offer it as a sacrifice. If it's an unclean animal, you got a choice. You can either offer a clean one or you can break its neck. But the firstborn belongs to me. And as far as for you, I'm going to take as my firstborn the whole tribe of Levi. They all belong to me. Instead of taking your firstborn son and pulling him out of your house, because that wouldn't be, that would be mean. It'd be like that witch in that fairy tale. Okay, whatever that was. I don't remember. Okay, I knew there was something like that out there. Instead of me taking your firstborn, I'm just going to take Levi for myself. But what I need you to do is I need you to pay a tithe. I need you to pay a tithe to Levi because they belong to me. I need you to redeem your own children. You're going to pay some money to pay for your own children. Okay. Because why? Why would you want that? Because I need you to understand that you're my possession. You belong to me on this earth. See, the tithe shows ownership. And it's a way of faith to say, I got you now, God. I see. I see what you're doing. Oh, it's even deeper than that. I'm about to break it down for you in a couple of weeks. We're going to get into it. We're gonna, I'm going to read it together, and we're going to go through it line by line, and you're going to see what I'm trying to tell you. The tithe is about ownership. It's a way for you and I to say, I belong to you. I belong to you. And again, I told you, you pay your tithe where you want to. I'm just saying you, you need to get on board with that <laughs> for your own walk. Amen. All right. The tithe is not your choice. Do, do you understand the word of God says that? I don't have time to get into that right now, but in the book of Malachi, it says that. The tithe is not your choice. It shows respect. Look at this. 
It shows respect to God's firstborn. The tithe is interconnected to the firstborn. You got to take my word on this because you might not have studied it for yourself. I'm here to tell you, if you go back and you read Exodus chapter 12 of the Passover, Exodus chapter 13, you're going to start to see that the the tithe is showing respect to the firstborn. For Israel, they pay tithe to Levi, whom God regarded as his firstborn. For Abraham, he paid tithe to Melchizedek, a type of Jesus. For Christian, we pay tithe to the house of God that there might be food in his house. We pay tithe in recognition of the firstborn. When we do, we are recognizing ownership. You are not your own. You were bought with a price, the blood of Jesus. We belong to God. He purchased us. And the tithe says that we recognize that. I recognize that you purchased me. I recognize that I am not my own. If you don't like this, then you don't like the Bible. I'm just going to be real with you. If you're having trouble with this right now, I'm just, trying to, I'm just trying to communicate to you what you may be feeling. Again, how, how many times have I said it? 10, I'm not asking you to pay money to this church. I'm trying to make a spiritual point. It's a spiritual truth. The tithe recognizes ownership. And when we do it, the tithe says, I understand now, God. I understand you purchased me. And I'm no longer my own. I was bought with a price. Praise God. Can I get?